Uh, when she takes a picture of the the devil thing, with her the boyfriend words, right next to it, and the words get rearranged to something die. I think it's <laughs> right. Um, well, here, here's another reason you should not. She shouldn't have gotten on it. I mean, to be fair, she's peer pressured on it. But there's another reason she should have gotten everyone else off of it beforehand. Yeah. Come right. I'm sorry. You hear Tony Todd's voice. You automatically know you're gonna die. Well, that's what I was saying. Yeah, you <laughs> avoid that at all costs, basically. I think, to be fair, she really does get pressure because her boyfriend gives her like a motivational speech about, hey, sometimes things seem a certain way, but they're never that way. How wrong was this guy? Well, <laughs> like, how wrong is it that his motivational speech is, hey, the reason people don't like these is because it takes control from them. Let it take control. I'm like, what kind of bullshit worked, are you spewing? That really worked out for you, buddy. Yeah, I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> It's a lack of control. Like, yeah, that's the point. It, that's why. That's why I'm worried. Yeah. <laughs> and she does not like being in lack of control, which is probably why she doesn't like any coasters. Now, when you go on a coaster, I like you. I I've been on every roller coaster at Kings Dominion, but after that, I just like stop doing it basically. But do you do you think there's a big difference if you sit in the front of the coaster or the back of the coaster or the middle? Like, is it really a different experience in your, in your experience? I want to say yes. It's more the visual over because you're sitting in the back. You're still going to get the entire experience. You're going to get the whole speed. You're going to get everything. You're just sitting in the back, but you don't get the visuals of what is coming at you. What you're what you should be planning for. Whereas if you're in the front, you can see what loops you're gonna hit. You get like on the Anaconda, you can see that you're gonna dive bomb right into some water, which I'm assuming is a tube there so you can breathe. They always ask my brothers, how are y'all not wet after riding that? I see that thing dive bomb into water. <laughs> so the front is basically theoretically, if you're afraid of roller coasters, that would be the scariest because you can see everything coming. Well, I guess, yeah, because you kind of you see the big drop before it happens and all that, so you're kind of like... Yeah, and the, the ride's going to be the same no matter if you're at the beginning or the end because the speed starts as the first car hits the top. The, mm. And the speed starts for the bottom as it's probably half what if it's like three-quarters away up the ramp. So no matter mm. what, you're getting the same amount of experience. Yeah. Um. So... We might as well jump in that opening premonition because I would say for me... It's the only time this movie actually has a premonition? Yes, which I think... Well, is at least through the main, the, the main meat of the story, I should say. I think I think that's a good thing to change it up a little bit, but in terms of premonitions, I like it a little bit less than the one in part two, the opening sequence, but I still like it more than the part one opening sequence. Well, part one was kind of bare bones plus like low budget. This one definitely feels like they have a little bit higher of a budget, so they wanted to utilize that with this big cataclysmic event. Part one had the best lead up to the premonition. Yes. Part one at the airport, the whole time, there's so many signs thrown at you. It really builds attention. So part one has the best lead up, but then the actual premonition itself, it's not yet. Yeah, they, they hadn't perfect the formula of like this big gory bloody like thing and as now I said last like, week i feel like part two perfected that part two perfected that and this is right there with that is also like all right people really want to see this this is going to be the the main thing that people are coming to see the movie for is this big sequence pretty much so we need like a lot of carnage here um if you're if you're wary of roller coasters you don't want to watch this scene because it's not going to convince you to suddenly enjoy roller coasters <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so we get this big event and you know people are dying people are getting kevin gets ripped in half girls are flying off the front the front half just flies off so those people actually had a pretty quick death yeah <laughs> but i want to uh, but let's go off of the event because let's face it the event is kind of hard to talk about without actually people visually seeing it well, the only thing I would add on the, the the event is just that the scariest thing I could think of probably would be like being at the top of roller coaster and it just freezes like to where you're just hanging up there. Like how they did with this one with, the, again, the hydraulics busted. Also, um, fuck the 
fuck Frankie for bringing his damn camera on there yeah, camera and have to screw them over. <laughs> yeah, but but then again, you also the hydraulic fluid was already leaking, so there was something going to happen no matter what. But I just want to bring up this end, the, the ending of the event. Wendy's getting off. Everyone is getting off because they're either getting into a fight or forced to. But security guard is, as she's saying, there's something wrong with the hydraulics. The security guard screaming, no one else gets off this ride. That guy just killed like eight people. <laughs> I I was actually. I was actually mad that the boyfriend kept being like, let me off, let me off, let me off. He said it like 11 times, let me off. And they just ignored him. They sent him to his death. Yeah, like, because the damn guy, one, there, there is a sign that says if you come in, you're not going to be allowed, or you get on the ride, you're not going to be allowed off till the ride's over. So there is that sign. Uh, but at you, the same time, it's, yeah, come on now. At the same time, there's an issue going on. You're being told there's a hydraulic issue. That's something that you should look into at the very least. Well, and yeah, then you got another character before the ride goes, like, hey, just get me off, and then you can let everyone else go. Yeah, and there's special, no matter what the generic rule is there about that, there's special situations where you have to be like, okay, if the dude's girlfriend's freaking out for whatever reason and saying all this stuff, then you haven't started the ride yet. Why not at that point? Let Honestly, them off. Yeah, that, that guy, they, they got to feel guilty afterwards to a degree because like yeah you could like huh all the opening movie things with the the plane crash the 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 car crash and this all of these are like mechanical Mm screw-ups like there there's like there's a human error element to all this stuff in terms of just like mechanical failures so it's like i'm surprised there's not for this for example there's was there not a massive lawsuit against the theme park or whatever it is? Like, because it seems like you just sent a bunch of teens to their death because of a, a faulty mechanics, right? So yeah, I'm assuming there was a lawsuit because we never see this carnival again. But um, and I guess from the characters we follow, there may not be. Although I would think that if there's there a lawsuit, mentioned. if there's a lawsuit, she's going to be heavily questioned the lawsuit because they're going to be like, hey, like, what were you seeing that made you like freak out and stuff? So. There's definitely some litigation here that we probably don't know about, but yeah, this is like a huge mechanical failure and the security guards. If, if there's, if a witness can be like, Hey, people ask to be let off and you wouldn't let them off. Then those security guards, I mean, who knows like what kind of litigation they're going to face too, because I don't know. They could say we're just doing our jobs, but I, I I would feel guilty if a dude was literally like, let me off 11 times and I don't let him off. And then they just, he dies, you know? So well, I'm also surprised they didn't just fill in the back row. That's another mm-hmm. thing. Like, yeah. why didn't you? I, I understand these people were going to die violently, but why did they just let a half a ride go and not fill in the back row? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't. Yeah, what was the the huge rush to make the ride go? And like, how do you not take someone serious who's like, you know, freaking out that way? Especially since she's. Least- Screaming, hey, hydraulic leak. That is automatic terms for stopping the ride and getting a mechanic to come check it out. Yeah. I I think even, even if I hadn't seen these movies, now because I've seen the movies, anything like that, someone's like, the plane's going to explode. There's something wrong here, blah, blah, blah. Anybody does that now, come from seeing the movies, I don't want nothing to do with this, right? Mm-hmm. But even not even not having not seen the movies, I really think if someone said that, I would still be like, let me off. I would still be just <laughs> paranoid enough to be like, uh, yeah, I don't want to go on this ride if someone's saying anything was wrong with the ride. So I right. feel like every, everybody on that roller, everyone on the roller coaster probably should have had some feeling of like, yo, stop this. Like, <laughs> right. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't. What's even worse is that big security guard is definitely has a lawsuit against him because he straight up tackles Wendy when she comes back in screaming, stop the ride. He just bulldozes right into her. Yeah, and like, I mean, like they got to feel terrible once they right there see the whole thing actually screw up and everything. But yeah, I, I just, uh, I actually felt bad for the boyfriend because it wasn't like he clueless he was going to his death. He was like, let me off like 11 times. And they just yeah. went off. So. Oh, well, yeah. 
All that said, uh, the movie now we're back to high schoolers because um, the part two was more like adults. But now we have more of the feel of part one. I feel like the aftermath feels like the aftermath of part one a little bit where we have like um, funeral scenes. We have like sort of a, a gathering. Um, our, our main character, what what is her name actually? Oh Wendy. Wendy and Kevin, right? So, yeah. And you love this actress so much. You don't know her character's name. Cause I just say Mary Elizabeth. That's the thing. If I know the actress so well, then it's like I just say that. So oh, you know her well. Um, Can you introduce me? No, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, don't know. I don't know her that well. I guess. Um, well, she basically has been tormented by this, so she doesn't want to graduate. She doesn't want to go to graduation. She doesn't want to do anything. Kevin tries to sort of reconnect with her, but she basically puts him in his place and says, "Hey, we were never really friends. We were associates. Associate." We were associated Associates? by, yeah. Why can't I say that word? We were so no, no. Actually, I was trying to say we're associated. We were associated <laughs> through our respective boyfriend and girlfriends. Now they're gone. You know, my boyfriend said you're supposed to look out for me, look out for me on the ride, not ongoing forever. And Kevin's just left there, like, eh, what did I do? Which I kind of feel that way too. Well, late, later on, Kevin comes back to her when it's pouring buckets of rain to explain to her the events of the first movie. Now, this is very funny to me because Kevin Hare has done his research. He found an article explaining Flight 180. And from the article, he says, oh, and by the way, they died in the order that they would have died of on the plane. And then he adds, unless somebody intervenes, then it skips you. The article he read, the article he read said that a news article, a news article said, unless someone intervenes and it skips you. That wasn't a news article. So you read? I, I guess what? they interviewed clear before she died. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, because because one thing about this movie is that you don't have Claire to explain things. Right. So you're kind of thinking, well, how are they going to get around that? And like the man found an article online that said, hey. Like did did Tony Todd's character like write an article? I don't understand. Well, the the other problem is then that article should have also said these people are still dead though. <laughs> well, if they interviewed Claire, then Claire would have said, but it circles back to you after it skips you. Right. So the, it doesn't matter who they interviewed for that bit of information. It still would have come back to, but it's still going to keep coming after you until you are dead. What if this whole movie, the the fave of these characters, everything that happens is all because Kevin like forgot to finish reading the, the rest of the article. <laughs> like there was a there was a page two he didn't click to <laughs> to see, oh, by the way, it'll well, skip you, but it's coming back afterwards. Well, let's be fair. Wendy did the same thing because she kind of showed part two, but because Kevin's already given us the rehashment, she didn't give the re rehashment, but she didn't even add. But they just kept coming; just the death kept coming after them. Well, again, in the in the context of this movie, the fact that the biggest reveal for them should be like that: yes, that all the characters from the previous movies are dead. So, if there's no survivors, then what do you mean by this whole "if it intervenes"? It's like it's so funny because it's just, it's like two lines thrown out by Kevin that are like. It's just like, okay, who wrote this article? <laughs> why, why aren't you asking more questions about this specific thing? And like, why do you think like I, it's just, it's just, it, it was you because because you're wondering like, okay, without Claire, how are they going to get this information? And outside of Tony Todd telling them, which doesn't happen in this movie, <laughs> so we don't get him in the middle in the morgue where he's going to explain it. So that's the way they find out. So, um, anyways, I thought that was funny, but yeah, so same, but. Let's go ahead to our first uh, casualties of the movie. Yeah, you know, um, Ashley and Ashlyn. I I would say that I think like elevators and other things. I think there's probably a healthy fear of these sort of tanning beds where you're locked into a thing with like a heat switch that can turn the heat up or the heat the heating can malfunction. I don't think I'd put myself in one of those. Well, to be fair, I wouldn't either. As you can see, I am white as a ghost, probably because I don't go outside. So, um, you remember you when, uh, you remember when, um, 
when Jennifer Love Hewitt was locked in one, and I still know, and <laughs> yeah, uh, Ben Ben Willis had, had done this, and they they come to they come to the, the thing and like they're like we had to bust it open, they don't want to work, and they don't think to just unplug the damn machine. <laughs> like I don't, I don't. Well, at least Death in this one is a little smarter than you know the our characters because Death lock first off Ashley obviously these two are idiots but Ashley in a way to not have anyone walk in on them naked puts a, mm-hmm. locks the front door and puts a sign up back in 30 minutes ah okay so there's that also uh why did the store clerk guy of the tanning salon not unlock the deadbolt or at least take his keys with him so he could unlock it on his way in uh, instead of trying to use a bottle of lotion. These movies always have mechanical failure and like bad service, incompetent employees. But the more important question, why is death so pissed off at these two? <laughs> why is this death so vengeful and painful? Like, I, I know, know they're not, I know they're not set up as like super likable characters, but I feel really sorry for them after this scene. Jeez. So I know why. It harkens back to Miss Miss Lupin from the first movie. Yeah. She disrespected uh Alex, so she got the worst death. These two, in their weird ditzy blonde way, kind of disrespected Mary or Wendy. So they got the worst death. Wasn't it wasn't death being disrespectful towards Alex when he threw a brick at his face? Well that was because he finally got tired of Alex just <laughs> Uh, cheating him so he's like you know what screw you <laughs> just he's like smack okay. the brick out of frustration he's like he's like hey th- these are my special somebodies with their premonitions eventually i do have to kill them but i don't want some other teen human being or i don't want another to disrespect being dis- them like you in the meantime yeah i don't it's something to it because yeah next to miss lupin i mean well miss lupin the first one nor in part two and now these two here, just absolute torture, where some people just get <laughs> off easy with a quick and relatively painless death, it seems. These two have to be burned alive. Ugh. Well, let's be fair. <laughs> Half of it was still on them. They messed with the thermostat. They brought in a liquid. And they and they panicked, to, they panicked before it actually got so hot it was burning them to the point where they couldn't move the board. They decided not to think to stick their hand out and move the board out of the way. And they also didn't get out of the tanning bed when it started getting uncomfortable. So all half of that, it is on them too. All of that is traced back to them being idiots, but I don't think being stupid should get you that. Well, it does in this one. Well, yeah, I guess death maybe <laughs> does take points away for stupidity and just... I, I will say... Out. Blonde Ashley at least tried to escape by going out the where the fan the fan was. Yeah. Whereas brunette Ashley just sat there screaming. <laughs> so so Death's favorite dish is crispy fried human. This is the return of the crispy fried human. Yes. And this one really crispy fried. That is definitely a closed cascade right there, my man. Oh. <laughs> You're making me feel even worse thinking about this. Jesus. <laughs> you Why do I care? bring it up. Why do I feel so bad for fictional characters who don't exist? I don't know. I just think death was <laughs> unneedfully cruel here, man. All right, let's move on. Um, well, <sighs> uh, Wendy slaps Frankie. I just wanted to bring that up because Frankie's a sleaze bag. He is sleaze bag, and we get a funeral scene for the the two female characters who have been burned alive. Um, now. This movie does address something that I think is often ignored in horror movies and I think should sometimes be addressed. You always wonder about sometimes these characters in movies, they're going on these big, huge journeys, doing all this stuff. And you think to yourself, have these characters eaten anything? I'm <laughs> sure they're hungry. Like, have they used the bathroom? about choking. Like, yeah, have they used the bathroom? Have they eaten? There's all these things like human functions you need to survive that sometimes aren't addressed in these movies i like that at the funeral hair they're like hey have you eaten like nope let's go get some food this yep, feels like r- real life so well let's bring up that wendy's also the only one that talks about feeling a presence with her this time 
None of the, the other two didn't mention that. This one, she actually says she feels a per, negative, dangerous presence with her at all times. Yeah, so death, even though it hasn't really started attacking her yet, it's definitely... The one the one thing I see that's very similar with what she's feeling, though, and there's like the cold air and the gust of wind, it's in the... It's a little bit in part one, I would say. Because mm -hmm. uh, Alex has a few times where you see kind of the cold air, the gust of wind come in, the blowing leaves. And then even it's it's there with um, the alternate ending with Claire. I, it didn't really, yeah, in part two, there wasn't much there. The other thing with this movie we should address probably is the... Pictures? The pictures, because let's be honest, part two, part two kind of OD'd on the premonitions. Yeah, this one at the very least at the very least, did it to where she only got the one premonition and then they had to use the pictures for clues on how they were supposed to die. This movie is not going to add any new rules or really nothing. It's not going to really add anything to the lore of the movies, but at least this picture thing is a little bit cooler because the characters have to look at the picture and from there figure out, okay, how does this play into my death? So it's mm -hmm. more of a fun thing than just, Kimberly from part two randomly whenever she feels like it getting random premonitions that determine the plot of the movie. This at least has a better flow to it. I would say in terms of the middle of the movie, I will um, say the first yeah. movie's premonitions also felt pretty realistic because they were just little snippets as if he looked in a mirror, or just turned around and saw something real quick. It wasn't a full on. He had a fall to the ground premonition. No, the first movie had the best signs. The signs in the first movie are like all brilliantly, brilliantly, brilliantly done. <laughs> it's just a shame that you gave it, to, gave that premonitions to Alex, who did jack all with those signs. <laughs> <laughs> that was our, that was our thing in the review of that movie. It was like, yeah, you should have gave found someone better to the premonitions to. Alex is always late or screwing up with his premonitions, or just doesn't say shit. Yeah, yeah, he he didn't make the most of the premonitions. He always got know. like a he always thought about it for ten minutes and then came to it later. But there's I like another, the picture thing. So yeah, there's another thing that's a slightly reoccurring. It happens one, uh, two or three times in this, and that is the song that plays every now and then, whenever mm. death is around Wendy. Yeah, because uh, well, I forgot what it was called, but it's always someone is walking behind you. Yeah, and in this scene, a dang truck, rogue truck, just starts coming down. Pretty sure it's the same truck from part two. Um, just starts coming down and this smashes. This might be the same truck. Either that's no, actually, the same truck is the one that pins Kevin's truck to the wall, so that way they couldn't drive away. The truck that pinned them to the wall. <laughs> what the hell was going on there? Who I don't know. How do you, how do you you know there's a drive through next to you? How do you do that? And then again, like just going back to like we know that death causes, but like afterwards and the the investigation of what's happening, how does that person not get charged with something like you <laughs> pin you pin them in basically? What uh, I think what it is is person's probably lost his job for negligence, but what it probably happened was death somehow death knocked the air brake on off so that way the truck it no longer has its brakes and it just and it was kind of on a hill so it kind of just came down onto the truck they should just call this whole series negligence <laughs> this whole series is negligence <laughs> taking the form of death i guess but well frankie um, gets uh frankie gets an engine to the face or head well Frankie's refusal to even turn his head around to see what's going on. So again, not saying he deserved it, but you, you you hear a panic behind you and you can't even address it by turning your head and looking to see what's uh, going on. So in the original DVD, when this movie first came out, they had a little bit on the DVD called choose your fate. Yep. And what it, and what it did is you get uh, certain prompts come up. You choose either one or the other, and that's, then that's the movie a, plays out. That's that's the one I have. I have the choose your scare one. Okay, so this one and the choose your fate one, because I went through it and I played every single bit of it just to see the different bits of the movie. The movie still ends the same. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening is if you choose, I think it says there's a one part of the choose your fate where you're actively honking the horn. And Frankie turns around, actually, and flicks them off. Like, with the truck still coming. So, it's like, dude, really? 
Well, okay, I'm glad they didn't use that because that would have made him just like stupid on top of being a jerk because he would have seen a, a truck coming behind them. So that well, the, the thing is, if you choose that option, when Kevin and Wendy break out of the truck, Kevin actually grabs Frankie and pulls him away, actually uh, saving Frankie's life. Okay. And and then later on in the movie, you get another one where Frankie's being arrested for child porn, and it literally gets asked, was it worth saving him? <laughs> oh, my God. Jeez. And I'm assuming that his death happens while in jail. He just got beaten to death because child porn. <laughs> wow interesting uh i didn't like frankie anyway so i i can't really be too sad about him um maybe we should get to our you know um our weightlifting guy yeah um, this movie also kind of shock granted there's nine characters this movie has to kill off it yeah. shotguns through these deaths pretty quick yeah we don't we spend enough time with the main characters but the rest of them and I kind of like it because you, you can't accuse the movie of having a slow middle We're right. going from death, death to death to death. It keeps the action coming with any movie, even if, even though you're not getting a lot of character development from the side characters, they're kind of making up for it with just like good fun kills though. Right. Well, um, I want to say Lewis's death makes no damn sense to me for yeah. not because of the weights falling on his head. That makes perfect sense. What makes no sense is why the hell does a high school have Sharp ass scimitars hanging on the dang wall, sharp enough to cut through a damn safety chain of a piece of workout equipment. So I actually, I actually think that he's now at college. So it's a college. Either way, uh, <laughs> there's still an issue there. Because what yeah. if you get that one disgruntled uh, college student who wants to go shoot up the school, doesn't have a gun, so goes in there and has sharp ass scimitars to use on everybody. The He's going to flex motherfucker. The Skimitars was really weird. <laughs> and the gym itself, I mean, even if it's college they were, kids. They were, they were so... They're like, ah! It. They were on steroids. If I walk in the gym on the first day and that's going on, I'm like, nope. Going to I'm a out. gym. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, cause, I'm not here with that, so... Yeah, they were so passionate, but I get the feeling they were all on steroids. Oh, and yeah. then... And, I, think Lewis, I think Lewis was. Yeah. And to be fair... My wife, she watched it first time ever, and she said Lewis is fucking stupid because after the swords came down and he did the weight again, the weights fell on him. I'm like, so I don't think he's stupid per se because who really expects school scimitars to be sharp enough to cut through a piece of equipment safety chain? Yeah, and <laughs> I think this movie does – Throughout the series, you get this where you get the fake, you get the the fake sort of red herring thing where something happens and they're safe, but then that triggers the bigger thing to then kill them. Yeah, like they, with this they, one with they, the they, water they and that, that boombox. They pull that trick a lot. Yeah, where it's like, oh no, they're actually okay, and then boom, they're not okay. <laughs> um, I I'm thinking about the cops. I understand why the cops are like starting to get suspicious of our two main characters because wherever they go death follows death follows death is making a point to kill people in front of them always um yeah death is a little sly little asshole this time isn't he he really wants to fuck with wendy <laughs> well he does seem like he seems more involved with her than he was most involved i think with alex and in part two you had the premonitions but it didn't feel like he had that much of a presence with Kimberly, but this one, he feels again, like he has more of a presence with, with her. So, um, but, uh, we can talk about, let's see who's next here. Next is Ian and Aaron. Ian and Aaron now at their little like flower Lowe's shop. <laughs> yeah. Ian talks a lot in this scene and comes up with his own theories. Which, granted, is theories we already knew and already has been disproven. But, granted, these, for some reason, Kevin just didn't do the final bits of his research to find out they're all dead anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and Ian just basically on the spot makes up the idea that, hey, if you kill the last person, that's a thing. Like, he, he doesn't know. There's no way to prove that. It's just like he's just saying it, so. 
Well, it's a um, it's a theory on his part, but unfortunately, he still doesn't believe him up until now. Another bit of thing with warehouse work, mainly. I need to call my brother and talk to him more about this. But warehouse work, this uh, forklift has its keys still in it. Mm. Uh, most warehouses usually have the keys take if the piece of equipment is no longer going to be run for that day usually has the key taken out and put it in the shop so that way mm-hmm. stuff like what happens here does not actually accidentally happen which is gets the key to rev the engine and the mm-hmm. we get a rogue forklift so basically you're suggesting again that there's and negligence <laughs> negligence a lot of, like look death can't do it by himself he needs help from <laughs> Humans being, <laughs> humans being idiots and companies being idiots. Um, we don't really get to know Ian's girlfriend much at all, but again, you got to kind of feel bad about anybody taking a nail gun to the back of the head that many times. So. Yeah, especially since she was a redhead. I know you got to think for redheads. Uh, well, let's let's have a moment of silence for our redhead. Okay, you ready? Well, damn. <laughs> um, I... I want to say I want to say one thing about Ian's characterization. He goes from I, a kind of li- likable dude. I, I like Ian, and despite how the movie, I know the movie is kind of showing it from Wendy's perspective. Mm-hmm. But at no point in the movie, I know what they're going for. At no point do I actually see. Now that I watched and paid attention, I never really see him as a villain or somebody who's actually going to try to kill any of them. Did you like? Yeah. There's no. There's never a point where he's actually like, "I'm going to actually try to kill you." So he's, him he, per he se, wants, he, he he's mad at them. He wants to annoy them, but he, ne- I never actually him, take him as a villain. So him killing anybody, no. But him possibly trying to help Death and killing Wendy, yes, by just keeping her in the spot that she thinks she's going to die in. I don't think he was going to try to do that. I don't think he was that sinister. I think that he's depressed from his girlfriend being killed. Well, again the. Death of a loved one can make you do some stupid things. Yeah, but I don't think he. I don't think. I I, I literally don't think his intention is to actually hurt Wendy. At all. Well, well, honestly, when we get to his death, I have a theory about that. When we get to his death, well, I'll discuss that theory with you. Okay, <laughs> well, let me let me ask you a question. Um, What's up? Something very curious in this movie is that the she has all the pictures, which within the pictures reveals potentially the fate of. Her and her friends. Yes. They make a pact between her and him that let's not look at our pictures until we absolutely have to. Yes. I don't think I could be sitting in my room all day with the picture sitting on my desk revealing my fate and legitimately not at least once look at the picture. I would I feel like the curiosity there would be so strong. I almost don't buy her at the end being like, okay, I guess it's time to see what happens to me. I don't know. Would you be able to resist that? I'd be like, no, I'm gonna take a look. I, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna take a peek. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm taking a peek. But also, Wendy kind of does show that she is young and impulsive in this movie by look when she looks at her picture because she, yeah. even though her boyfriend's damn face, even I'm assuming he was standing still, her boyfriend's face looked like it was a flash, as if you're watching someone just roll past you out a window. Mm-hmm. But yet she takes the shirt that says McKinley as the sign. That's true. And McKinley just, I mean, unfortunately it's complicated because Ian McKinley and then the high school's name is McKinley. Yep. So that makes it seem like, oh, McKinley, he's going to try to kill me or something. So, uh, Like I said, I know she's young, she's impulsive. And also, again, I would be, I probably would have thought the same thing. His girlfriend just died. He's pissed at me. <laughs> But at the I mean, same I mean, time, the face is a little bit more of a clue than the McKinley shirts. I mean, the thing is, like, okay, part two, we had adults, one of them being a cop, right? Right. Honestly, and they, the two in part three, I mean, they they do better or just as good as like a freaking cop with all his resources and, and supposedly an adult woman. Like, they're not making decisions any worse than they did. I would say. Um. Of course, the twist here is that we find out that her little sister was actually well, on the roller coaster. So, I do got a question for you. Yeah. During the roller coaster scene. Yep. 
uh, the scene itself before the actual hanging when you see two random people fall yep. did you at any point see anyone in front of them cuz i didn't i had two sets of eyes mine and my wife's and she didn't see anybody up until those two random people just fell out from the sky <laughs> i got to be honest <laughs> I didn't go back to check on that, but that's a good point. I mean, this, I understand. They, they might have came out of nowhere. I mean, I understand they needed it for some form of intensity for the climax. They needed it, and they wanted to keep her secret to try and find them because the, otherwise the movie's kind of cut and dry. Do you think? But, some, wait, do you think somebody, whoever gave Wendy the premonition, like to mess with her, left her sister out of the premonition? No, what I. What I think it is, is, and this is more of a consistency error, I think, and possibly a very a, uh, thought process, because it's a very easy thing to look over. You know, you're not seeing somebody in the in the cart in front of you. But what I think it is, is they intentionally left the carts open until that death scene, that so that way they can then say, okay, they need to find who those two are. But they left it open so that way the audience also didn't know. Because, you know, with the, all the shots they would have done, any audience member would be like, that's Julie. I, I took it at face value, but I also, when she tells Kevin, Kevin says, like, my thought, it's like, I feel like Julie would have told you at some point by now that she was on the roller coaster. Like, I, you try to think about the motivation of, like, why would Julie hide that? What does Julie have to lose by, like, revealing that? Well, remember, Julie was originally, I guess, wasn't supposed to be there. It was seniors night because they yeah, even but, had that whole but, spat saying, what are you going to do? Tell mom. So maybe she just didn't want Wendy to know. So that way, Wendy didn't go tell mom. Is the, is Wendy going to care that much about, Hey, you happen to be on this roller coaster? Like it feels like a small thing. Considering what now, they're going through <laughs> now at no point in the movie. I don't know how close Julie is with her sister, but I guess at no point in the movie, Julie doesn't communicate with her sister. What's going on in terms of this whole thing. No. Nope. Because if she, if she does, then at that point, the sister has to be like, hmm, maybe I should tell you something. Right. So, but I get it because it adds a lot more interest now to the ending because she's like, oh, well, my sister's next on the list then. So, um, and let's face it, Jul Julie almost got pulverized. <laughs> oh, she yeah. Got, and, and to be honest, she should be dead after. One, I want to know who takes a horse to a mm -hmm. fireworks show. No yes. amount of training for a horse is going to get them so that way they're not afraid of fireworks going off. Yeah, I love it. I love it because um, <laughs> I, I, I found everything at the carnival, even like the the horse thing becomes almost like a chase scene. I don't know why, but to me. I was so un underwhelmed by the ending of part two in terms of there really being no climax outside like the highway scene, I guess. I found this like a way more exciting ending than part two. Well, it and was. Because you get you get the, the horse stuff and then we also get the Ian stuff afterwards. I, I mean, I felt bad for Julie's friend who <clears throat> literally had no idea she was in danger until the last second. Right before she like, got impaled. Yeah, I felt bad for her. So so Ian shows up and now I mean I've already been talking about it but I think he's just there to be so, around them try to get information it's like it's like his uh his way to grieve I guess is to like be annoying or something but I feel like I, it, I, don't, I don't think he was there to actually cause their death or help something cause their death what it could have been is he just wanted some kind of answers he wanted yeah. to confront them for an answer on what's going on cuz he's still he has some form of belief now, but he still doesn't 100% agree with it. And you can tell by his approach, he's emotional. Oh, yeah. But the way he's talking, he's very emotionally charged. Oh, yeah. Now, and then, you know, accidents, ha well, you know, death accidents happen, and he gets crushed by a sign, which now, was fucking hilarious. <laughs> it was because they do the thing of, like, all the cannons shoot off, and he's like, see, I'm not dead. You're dead. And then and the oh. sign just crushes him and he just gives that one last middle finger as he's dying. I I always wonder, I, I know obviously I've never been in this situation, but 
when a sign's coming down on you in the movies and stuff like that, it always seems like you have plenty of time to like get out the way. But I guess like in real time, it's happening quicker. You're in shock, so you don't think to move. But I would think like the human reaction would always be to like jump the hell out the way. Well, let's find yeah. out. Uh, well, well, I'll we'll set you in front of a sign. I will yeah. draw, or in this case, just to make it safer, not a sign. We'll do yeah. a basketball hoop. Okay, we'll get okay. you in front of a basketball hoop. I take out the pin and let the basketball hoop drop, and we'll see if you jump out of the way. It still sounds like you're trying to turn me into mashed potatoes. <laughs> no. I will not but be turned to mashed potatoes. But I do actually have a theory now that Ian's dead. Yeah. And that theory is, what if Ian didn't actually die upon the initial impact of him hitting the ground in the premonition? What if he was still alive long enough to also watch Julie's friend die? And maybe Julie didn't die immediately also. But yeah, Ian didn't die immediately until Julie's friend dies, and then he died sometime after that. So so let's go to this for a second, because I'm not sure if I understand mm-hmm. it, what's going on there. So so Ian was somebody intervened at the warehouse. Yes. Um, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin him. Kevin saved him out of the way of the stakes falling on him. So Ian's now back to the beginning, basically, where death's to try to go through everybody else first before coming back to him. Yes, but after only going after Julie and her friend, all of a sudden, Ian just gets killed. And I doubt death is going to allow an accidental death to happen. He he refused to allow a damn suicide to happen. What One guy on YouTube had a theory. He was using this to talk about Claire, though. I don't know if it ever comes up again, but he was using the idea that if you get skipped, death doesn't prioritize you. But if there's an opportunity to like kill you, he's not going to be like, all right, I'm going to wait now till I get back to you. He'll take an opportunity if it's there. So it's kind of like he's, he's not, you're not like on his list as next, but he's not, but he's not going to pass up the chance. I don't, I don't know, but I don't know how well that works. Cause in the first movie, yeah, car technically Carter got passed up, but after it recycled through everybody, it then went right back at Carter in the same order. It still would have gotten to him. So I feel like the skipping yeah. bit is still a thing as long as you're on that particular list of who it's targeting. This is something I used to like talk about Freddy in the Nightmare series where he acts different in like later sequels sometimes, right? What if death in the first one... Well, I guess... Well, yeah, we'll say the first one for now. Let's say death back then is like... This is going to sound silly, but... He's new at the job, so he's just now establishing rules and stuff like that. And he's more strict about things because when you're new at something, you're taking it more seriously. Well, let's say by the time part three comes, which is like pretty later in our timeline now, maybe he's a little more laid back on the rules. Like they're there, but they're like loose. He's like, nah, I'm going to go ahead and take care of this. Who who knows? We'd all be fucked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> he, he's in a it is a very indestructible creature being spirit whatever it is he's very indestructible he knows it and he if that's the case he seems to be enjoying himself every sequel coming out so i don't know how much i would uh want that kind of death <laughs> but at least in this yeah. that's why i'm thinking my theory does sound plausible because there are times when you do hit an impact that you don't immediately die from. Yeah. For all we know, Aaron actually ended up slamming in, even though Aaron fell last or before, uh, after Ian. Yeah. It's possible she slammed into the tr- the rail tracks as she was going down, instantly killing her. So, although I get that, remember though, Death did try to come after Ian at the at the warehouse. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense that it doesn't go after the entire crew before going back after Ian again. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying, but, but it can't be that. And like, he actually died after them because he did like go like in the order. He did try to kill Ian. Someone intervened and Ian was fine. Also to be fair with how high those stakes were, I'm not entirely sure of those would have killed him. Bruised them but I'm not sure if those actually would have killed him. Maybe. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause like I said, it, it definitely, it's gotta be something because after, after going after Julie and the friend, 
it should then am i right go to kevin well it does try to go after kevin but then oh, well, should yeah. have went after wendy 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 should go, should go after wendy and then when it fails on wendy's part now actually they do say though on the train her sister tells wendy that hey we went over this uh basically she says ian tr ian was going to be involved but she says something like we intervened on your behalf or we stopped it. I didn't see uh, any of that during the climax. Something in their brains made them think that we we stopped Wendy from getting killed. But I don't know what exactly that is. I don't know like I know when the when the cannons shoot off, they all jump to the ground to avoid mm -hmm. that. But it wasn't really anybody helping her to the ground to where they intervene. Yeah, so, she just dropped with everybody. It's unclear, but for whatever reason, they think they did something where Wendy was skipped. And remember, from their logic, because they don't have... They didn't read the rest of the article, <laughs> they don't know that it doesn't mean that they're safe forever. They think that... We but can they also... If, if that's the case, if they thought Wendy was skipped, then they should have known, hey, death's still going to come for you because look what happened to Ian. <laughs> These characters yeah. have shown a lot of times they are not dumb. They are they are still young, so they're impressionable, but they are not dumb. Yeah. So five months later. <laughs> well, let me let me let me establish one thing real quick too. So them being at the fair, that was the original ending. After after Ian dies, they would have walked away. We would have zoomed in on some kind of photo of the three of them, and that would have been our relatively happy ending. But as we've seen time and time again. Test audiences hate happy endings now. They want more. So because I, of the test screenings, we were uh, sent back to do reshoots uh, with a train. I hate test audiences for one. I, well, I've said never, it plenty of times. They hardly ever actually make things better with the stuff they go back and do. In my, they, my opinion, I don't know. So far, they've ruined every single thing I can think of. Scream 4, they ruined that ending. This one, honestly... I'm fine with getting happy endings with some movies. This one feels like it should have been, it could have been a good happy ending for once. Uh, what was the other one? No, that was this one you said test audiences messed the hail up. Well, the well, part one had the alternate ending that got, oh, yeah, that, that's what's I'm getting tired of test audiences. Movie makers need to stop doing test audiences and just allow it to content to be whatever they want. If audiences like it, awesome. If not, you won't know because now you because you let some 18-year-old say, oh, yeah, I didn't like this because, because damn, uh, you're going to have Julie James die. Yeah. Who cares? Hey. I want to see the movie from the person, from the director and writer's uh, point of view with their, what their vision originally was. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see no half-assed ending from a test audience when they all they do is fuck everything up. Yeah, that test audience should have said, what do you mean, Ben Sun? <laughs> 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 the hell is this? We reject the notion of Ben Sun. Right. Hey, or, yes. oh, a happy ending? Awesome! Because I think it's because it came out in 2000s. People were a little more cynical. Because nowadays, it's it needs to have a happy ending. Otherwise, it's not a good movie. It's that's true too. Nowadays, you really don't get typically those sort of like not happy endings. I think if the series is made now, now we'll see because there's a new one going to be coming out. Alleged, so we'll see yeah. that if that breaks a trend. But I think that the culture now, the test audience would be more like, give us the happy ending, not give us the the crazy ending. So, and also let's be fair. I think uh, you said Final Destination was not originally. Uh, scheduled for any kind of sequel anyway so they wanted that happy ending to close out the story which is all yeah. fine and dandy if you're not planning on making a sequel anyway <laughs> yeah yeah i mean final destination was the year 2000 at that time it wasn't it wasn't so much a thing during that area where everything every everything at that point was going to be like a a sequel franchise kind of thing not yet but um, so anyways, we get our train sequence now, um, which Wendy is, is had, Wendy's there with her new roommate and a friend. Yep. 
And then her sister walks on. Sister walks on, which immediately makes Wendy feel very uneasy. But the ultimate indicator is going to be when they also run to Kevin. Yep. And then we get our sequence of blood, gore, train collisions. Julie gets hit by a tire. Freaking uh, Kevin gets sucked out a window. And finally ending with Wendy being bashed in the face by another train. Which... Now, at least... At least they went back to the order that makes the original order make sense, which is Wendy, then, I'm sorry, Julie, then Kevin, then Wendy. Yeah. So and they, do, they do go back to the list at least. And the pictures still kind of go off of that. I mean, sure, Julie wasn't smashed by a horse, but she was smashed by a tire in a very fast fashion because she was standing next to the uh, merry-go-round. Freaking Kevin's face prop most likely did the exact same thing as that glass busted into his face at, right before he found his face into concrete and yeah and as i said what wendy should have picked up as the actual clue was the clue of her death she probably should have stayed out of that subway just to get hit by some negligent truck driver <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> whoever was driving the other train was the same truck driver from the uh I, from well if that's <laughs> the case because here's here's my final theory well after the premonition, come to find out death, I feel like gave her this premonition to fuck with her even more because they're already on the train. There's no way of getting off. And that's like, here, let me show you what I'm planning on doing to you. And you can't stop it this time. I thought about that a lot because it occurs to me, this is the first time a premonition happened where it was it unavoidable. Comes, it doesn't, it happened late enough to where it doesn't allow you to change things. But I also thought about the idea that just by her knowing about it and she tells Kevin and the way they're reacting, the train crash was going to be different because they, cause they, they kind of know what's coming. I'm not saying they necessarily survived, but it wasn't going to be what she dreamed because what she dreamed was just carnage. It, it was carnage, but also they weren't, they didn't know it was coming with them knowing it was coming. I'm not saying they could have, found a way to hide or something but it wasn't gonna be the same exact shape as we know the train still crashed but at least they know the train's gonna crash maybe they could have done something so i don't i don't, I don't know i don't I see think what I, I think death just decided to fuck with her <laughs> i don't know if part four references them well we'll find out next week if, if part four doesn't reference them i'm gonna somewhat chalk their fates up to just our imaginations <laughs> Well, because like well, I said, like I said, the premonition wasn't going to be exactly what it was because by the time it's happening, they've already had, they've had the premonition. Yes, they can't get off the train, but maybe they can hide. We don't know if everybody died. We don't know if everybody on the train died in the initial thing. Well, maybe. I, don't, we don't, we don't know. I don't really see how these three are able to get out of that. But then again, I've never been in a train accident, so I wouldn't know anything. But that finally leads me to my theory because there's one thing we kind of glossed over and that's tony todd's voice yet again as the train conductor right before the train crashes so there's my this is my final theory that is the same theory almost everybody else has huh. tony todd is our death and this movie really kind of settles that in even more by having him both as the devil at that devil's ride that demo got gets demolished by death's embrace. And then this other one with the train just being completely and utterly uh, mutilated and then crashed into by most likely Tony Todd and that jumped from that train, the doom train to that train. I still don't believe it. I just don't think that he's such like, he's always like, He's always helpful. He's always helping the human characters. I just maybe maybe he's aligned with that, but I don't think he's on death's side. I think he's on a side of trying to help them stop the the plans. I I don't know. It's tough. The well, then he part, sucks at it. What you have to remember, about, remember about part, part part three is that there was some reason they just didn't have like a role for him physically. So I think that the last second they got him to give his voice, but that's completely different in every other movie he is like some type of character involved with like death and stuff like mortician 
I think paramedic, like he, other things like it, the, what, his role in this movie almost doesn't seem like the same character from the ones in the other movies. That's well, he I'm wasn't. Like, it literally so, says devil voice uh, or a train yeah. conductor. <laughs> so maybe death was, t- maybe death just liked his voice and was like using his voice. <laughs> um, I do got a fun, um, a fun trivia thing. I just read. I want to oh. point out that when it, if true is very interesting. So it says in the subway, Wendy, Julie, and Kevin originally Kevin, <laughs> Kevin, a long day, too much coffee. Uh, <laughs> Wendy, Julie, and Kevin would originally have met Kimberly and Officer Burke. The two remaining stars for Final Decision Two. Wendy and Kimberly were originally meant to be cousins. The oh. plan was that Wendy would be in the subway with Kevin and Julie before she encounters Kimberly and Burke. The presence of Kimberly and Burke would allow for Death's plan to conclude with all of the survivors dying on the train. Hmm. The two actors were not available for the reshoots, and therefore the scene was changed with Randy, Wendy's roommate and her boyfriend instead. Ha! Huh. So... Yeah, but- then we wouldn't uh-huh. have gotten our uh, wood chipper death. Well, we never thing. got the wood chipper death. All we, <laughs> all we got is a weird summary of them being fed to a wood chipper. Don't look at me. I'm the one. I, I read it off of the Final Destination wiki, okay? Kimberly and Wendy do look alike. They could easily be cousins. And that would have been a good, a fun thing to see all of them on the train together. Just to die. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the the ending was still they're gonna die. <laughs> it is ambiguous at best. <laughs> uh, all right, I guess we can get to our final thought. Well, let me see if there's anything else worth. Uh, hold on, give me. A well, just giving you a heads up. One thirteen. All right. Um. So, with part three, I think that. The only real downside about the movie is that I didn't really add anything new to the lore. It's basically recycling the same ideas, but it is executing the ideas very well. And the characters, I feel like, are the strongest since part one. I feel like with the two main characters, we have something closer to uh, to Alex and Claire than what we got in part two in terms of the main characters. And I think they do a good job of just focusing on those two. And I love the roller coaster sequence. And the death scenes, I would say, are good enough. They're not the best in the series, but I think they're good enough. The tank salon was overly brutal, I would say, but whatever. Um, And I do like the ending sequence a little bit better than part two. I like the fact that they survived on the trip. I like the fact that the train sequence was there to a degree. I would have liked the happier ending, but... I don't mind the train ending so much. I just thought it was kind of weird that the premonition doesn't give them time to get off the train. But um, I, I'm i going to go high. I'm going to go three stars. For me, it's probably up there with one of my favorites in the series. Um, I think I still like part one a little bit more. But overall, I do like this better than part two. I don't know how it's going to stack wins part four and five. But the two main characters being strong, the formula is still fun. I enjoy the movie. I'm going to go three stars on it. Okay. Well, he only likes the characters because Mary Elizabeth Winston. Um, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic actress. <laughs> but anyway, I just got to go with uh, starting this off by saying, granted, I've only watched this movie maybe five times my whole life, but I always remember having a pretty good memory. Of watching, I always had fun with it. Now that I watch it again, honestly, I feel like I, I used to say part two was my favorite. I feel like after watching it again and then see and then talking about it, there's not a whole lot of negatives with this movie. Characters are strong. The deaths are pretty fun, and one of them pretty brutal. Death is a brutal fucker this time, especially since he just seems to really like Wendy. Oh just, my gosh! <laughs> just some advice to death. You know, start your day, have a nice breakfast, like get some sunshine in the morning. Just put yourself in a good mood because 
with these characters, he wasn't in a good mood. He was in the mood to, for chaos. He woke up with vengeance on his mind. Oh, he want and he wanted to mess with Wendy bad. I don't, I don't know how many. At least in the first two, he didn't always wait until our main character was in front of his victim before he actually targeted that victim. He made her watch everything, and I kind and I kind of dig it. Um, this the score is pretty good, uh, but as Vic said, there's no real lore added to this. It's a lot of lore we already got. It has to be rehashed because all these characters don't know it, even though they still don't know it because they didn't know the actual ending to either of those. So overall, Fair. so overall, uh, Tony Todd's still death, and I'm gonna have to give this movie th- three stars myself. It is a fun time. It's fun to just sit back, relax, watch. You don't because again, no, no new lore. You don't really need to actually pay attention to much except for just have a fun time, get some popcorn, maybe some beer, if you like beer, uh, pet your cat, and, and just be thankful you are not these characters. So three stars. Yeah, the thing too also to add, um, you don't need to always add lore. Like If you add lore, sometimes it raises questions you don't have answers for. Like Part two was on the borderline where it was like trying to do too much with the lore. To where it kind of did get to play where like, oh, this is kind of complicated a little bit when you think deeply about it. So not inter- just using the lore you already have and just like executing well, that just usually makes for a good sequel too. You don't always need to like try to add new rules because I think, I'm not for sure, but I think part four is going to try to add some stuff and I don't know if that's going to go over well, but we'll see. Um, but for now, uh, if you have to go on a roller coaster, don't ignore the signs. And also, um, if you take pictures on your phone, look at the pictures and look to see if there's anything like uh, sinister in the photos. Or and if you hear Tony Todd's voice before you enter that, just don't get on it. Yeah, go get a funnel cake instead. Get a hot dog. Oh yeah, funnel cake, some chocolate sauce, dip it in your funnel fries. Oh, delicious. Also, if you go in the gym and you see two uh, two big old things, uh, what are they called? Scimitars, uh, the swords. Yeah, when you see two big scimitars in the gym, just go to. Plan of fitness or something instead. Just, just yeah, kind of... they don't have any sharp swords. Why make it sharp? Because they want people to die. Apparently. Well, as always, folks, you don't have to go home. You do have to pet your cat, go out to the nearest club, party like you work tomorrow, because you probably do, and then enjoy a night of debauchery on the town. Not for what? me, because I have no money. Enjoy yourselves. E- e- even with money, would you really want to go out for a night on the town and debauchery? Terrible uh, that, advice. That depends on who our audience is. No, stay in the house, watch Final Destination 4, so you play can play some ready games. For ne- be ready for next week when our Final Destination 4 podcast comes out. So don't forget to play some games either. Yeah. What?